Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, all praise and all thanks belongs to Allah. And we ask Allah to shower his peace, his blessing, his benediction upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his family, his companions, and the righteous everywhere. I greet you all, my dear brothers, sisters, friends, and honored guests, with the greeting words of peace, the greeting words of paradise, the greeting words of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh boy. I didn't come all the way from Canada to hear that. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. C'est bon, good. I wish to thank the organizers of the Muslim Think Tank for inviting me here to this uh, wonderful gathering. I'm very honored to be with all of you, with all of these uh, wonderful speakers, presenters, and performers. I have been asked to speak about a very interesting topic that I have titled Signatures of Time, the Spiritual Origins of Modern Music. Of course, within our particular religious community, the discussion of music is a very polarizing one. However, before we actually get into that discussion, it's very, very important to clarify definitions. As Muslims, before we define or come to a conclusion at about a particular issue, we have to define exactly what it is that we are speaking of. So first of all, what is spirituality? Spirituality involves three things. It involves the soul, which in Arabic is called nafs. And the nafs or soul is defined as our personality, who we are our inclinations to happiness, to sadness, to melancholy. If someone describes your personality, they're describing your soul. Number two, we have something called spirit, or in the Arabic language called a ruh, which is ultimately the sacred condition in which we were created. It is a gift granted to all human beings by God Almighty, but knowledge of which we have not been given but a little. And number three, we have the heart, which in Arabic is called al-qalb. And the heart is the filter through which our nafs is fed by our ruh. And the analogy I love to give is the analogy of the radio. You have some radios that are big, some radios that are small, some radios that have really good bass, you know, especially if you're playing, you know, reggae music, funk music, you need a radio that has really, really good bass. That's the body of the radio. That's analogous to the soul or nafs. But of course, for any radio to come to life, that radio needs electricity. No radio can come to life except without electricity, and that electricity is analogous to a ruh. There is no life except with the spirit. But of course, the electricity needs a means to travel into the radio, a means of traveling into the radio. And the qalb has a function of acting as a filter between a ruh and the nafs. And the one who is pure of heart is one who is more spiritual. In fact, in my work as a chaplain, I hear many people say that I am not too religious, I'm more spiritual. I'm not religious, but I'm more spiritual. Well, spiritual has to do with this particular process. Spirituality has to do with feeling. Spirituality has to do with creativity. And number two, we have to define exactly what it is when we speak about music. What exactly is music? Music involves four things. Number one, it involves rhythm. What is rhythm? Rhythm relates to forward motion. That our lives, in fact, are incubated by rhythm. 
In fact, our bodies manifest rhythm through the heartbeat. When we walk, when we rock, movement is about rhythm. And there are words, at least in the English language, that relate to rhythm or being of sound body and sound mind. Timing is everything. If you live a very balanced life, you are considered to be someone who is in sync. All of these things relate to rhythm. And then we have melody. Melody basically is a series of notes that create a sweet arrangement of sound, melody. And all religious and spiritual traditions, they have a method of connecting with the sacred or connecting with the divine through either singing or chanting. And as Muslims, we know that our most common form of chanting is the recitation of the Holy Quran or the calling of the adhan, the calling, call to prayer that we hear five times a day in Muslim majority countries. Number three, we have harmony, and harmony is the bringing together of notes or the reconciling of differences, harmony, bringing things together. And jazz musicians usually call it progression, progression. And finally, when we define music, we define music through silence because music generally is defined as the relationship between sound and silence. Sound and silence. Oftentimes, you'll have a conductor who is about to lead the orchestra, and they'll begin by lifting their hand. Moments of tension and silence, and when they drop their hands, you hear this symphony of sound. Spirituality, music. What is the relationship between the two? I have a history in music, not too much of a history in music, but I was always fascinated with rhythm. And being the child of Jamaican parents, of course, our lives are very actively involved with rhythm. And when I learned about Islam and I was introduced to the Shahada, La ilaha illallah. There's no God but Allah. I was very fascinated with the rhythm. And when I realized that la ilaha illallah may actually be related to the most common time signature that we have in Western music, 4-4, four, four, la ilaha illallah, I began to reflect on this. And some of our musicologists say, well, with the entry of Muslim populations, in particularly the Iberian Peninsula, the rhythm of the Shahada had a great effect upon the way Europeans understood music and composed music. Let us fast forward. A very difficult episode in history called the transatlantic slave trade took place where Africans were kidnapped and brought to the Americas. And we know that some 20% of those enslaved Africans, in fact, came from Muslim majority nations, such as the Fulani, the Mandinka, the Wolof. And many of these people possessed not only religion, spirituality, but culture. But because of the horrors and the difficulty and the tragedy of slavery, religion was lost, but the spirituality and culture was preserved through the music, was preserved through the music. And many of us have studied the relationship between the early slave haulers, the early field songs of the slaves, and Islam. We know the call to prayer. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. 
Ashadu an la ilaha illallah Ashadu anna muhammadan rasulullah We're very familiar with this sound. If we heard the early field haulers, the early blues chants, and even if you were to go to a southern church in the United States of America, you might hear something like this. Said, I'm going to the graveyard. Said, I'm going to the graveyard. Said, I'm going to the graveyard to lay this body down. Perhaps those of us with a sensitive ear will, ear will recognize the relationship between the two. And many of our ethnomusicologists have said that the origin of the blues, the origin of the blues, which in fact is the origin of all popular Western music, is not in fact in America, rather it is among the Muslims of Africa. So when we speak about modern music, we're not just speaking about something frivolous, but rather we're speaking about a genre of music that was born in the hearts of African Muslims who were enslaved in the Americas. The genius of the black American community is appropriation. They were able to take their particular condition and make something meaningful through it, create their own narrative. Not only in the blues, but also in religion. We have many proto-Islamic movements that took ownership of Islam through using the symbols of religion, the symbols of Islam, to bring meaning to their lives and to free the community from oppression. the lost found nation of Islam, the Moorish Science Temple, even the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which was founded by the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Their slogan was, One God, One Aim, One Destiny, which was actually gifted to them by a colleague of Marcus Garvey, Muhammad Dus Ali. When we fast forward, we can see that Islam played a very big role in the lives of many jazz musicians, which inherited the spirit of the blues. We have Max Roach, we have Ahmed Jamal, who did a collaboration with a very popular local artist here in France, which I will mention in a moment. We have, as well, Art Blakey, we have the great Yusuf Latif, we have John Coltrane, who had an album called A Love Supreme, and many of the members of the quartet were influenced by Islamic spirituality, and one of their albums called A Love Supreme, at the beginning of the album it begins, A love supreme, a love supreme. I can sing, right? Is that okay? A love supreme. Well, I'm talking about music after all. A love supreme, a love supreme. But many of those who were witnesses to the actual recording session said that they weren't actually saying a love supreme, they were actually saying a law supreme, a law supreme, a law supreme. The great John Coltrane. We have Alice Coltrane, the wife of John Coltrane, who was very much influenced by Islamic mysticism, commonly known as Sufism or Tasawwuf. We also have, as well, the great Pharaoh Sanders. All of these jazz musicians influenced very much by Islam and who identified with Islam. When we fast forward, we can see, as well, in modern hip-hop music, we have many who are Muslim or who identify with Islam. We have the great Rakim from the great Eric B. and Rakim duo. duo. We have Raekwon and Ghostface Killer. We have Nas, Ice Cube, Q-Tip. 
we also have Ali Shaheed Muhammad, the great Yasin Bey, commonly known as Most Deaf. We also have Janet Jackson. Yes, what have you done for me lately? Janet Jackson. In fact, there is some suggestion that even Michael Jackson himself may have been a Muslim, but for sure, Jermaine Jackson uh, is a Muslim. And also, I mentioned that we have, I know I'm coming to France, so I have to big up, I have to bring up, big up the France hip-hop scene. We have the great Abdul Malik, who is a wonderful, wonderful poet and hip-hop artist who did a wonderful collaboration with Ahmed Jamal on an album called Marseille. So finally, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, this is a picture of Bob Marley. Has anyone ever heard of Bob Marley? <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. Well, you know, I've lived in Africa and I've traveled a few countries around the world and whenever I say that, oh, my mother and father are from Jamaica, the first thing they say is, eh, hey, Bob Marley, Bob, one love, one love. And I'm very proud of that. Because the beautiful thing about Bob Marley is that Bob Marley was able to capture the collective imagination of the people of the world through his music informed by his spirituality. So the question I have for myself and for all of you, and especially for Muslim artists, can we do the same? Can we do the same? Can we capture the collective imagination of our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues, our fellow citizens with our music informed by our spirituality? Can we be faithful to our tradition? Can we be faithful to showing the beauty of our spirituality through our music? I think we can. One of the most popular quotes by Bob Marley, which I wish to end with, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. May God guide us all on the straight path, the path of those whom he has blessed, and not the path of those who earn his displeasure nor those who go astray. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.